God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over all the earth. and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Bob Stevens. Bob, is that any way to treat your wife? You know, you'd better start being nice to me. On account of, I think, maybe, I'm going to be a mother. What? Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> Honey. Maybe he can tell us for sure. Think of it. Me, a real live father. Well, I might as well start practicing. Three cornered pans, huh? Well, no time like the present to start. Seven Junior, in there, over. Under, no. Under and over. <laughs> ah. The new ones have four corners. You're a little out of date. Well, I was just, uh... <laughs> Say, Doc, do you think we're really going to be parents? No, it's too early to tell from looking, Bob. But as I told Sally, I'll run an AZ test and let you know in about a week. Dr. West, you just seem to have an answer for everything, don't you? Remember when you first told Bob and me the facts of life? You think I can ever forget it? <laughs> Think of it, Doc. Sally and I have been married a whole year now. And if it hadn't been for you, I, I guess we never would have made it. <laughs> Remember, Doc, when Bob and I came trotting into your office just before we were going to be married? We couldn't wait to get those premarital physical examinations out of the way. Remember? What a time that was. Hello, children. Well, here we are, Doc. The two lovebirds, all ready for the wedding. Sit down. Are we healthy enough to get married? Yeah, both as solid as a new dollar. Sally, that first baby didn't hurt you a bit. You can have a dozen more if you want to. And Bob, you'll be pleased to know that there's no trace of your old VD. 100% cured. What did you say about a first baby? Sally, you never told me you'd been married before. Doctor, what did you call it? VD? You mean to say that Bob has actually had one of those horrible diseases? That isn't true, Doctor. Is that true, Bob? Just a minute, Sally. One scandal at a time. When were you married before? I wasn't. But the doctor said you'd had a baby. That's right, I have had a baby. You mean it was illegitimate? That's right, illegitimate. 
And now, will you please tell me what the good doctor meant when he mentioned your old VD? All right, if you must know, I did have it. But it's no worse than having an illegitimate child. I think it is. Why, I, I'd sooner marry a leper. Why, of all the unreasonable, little Miss Purity has herself a baby out of wedlock and then plays holier than thou. A fine attitude. Thank you for letting me know about this in time, Dr. West. And now I'm going out into the clean, fresh air. Well, there went my happy wedding right out the door. I'm terribly sorry, Bob. I just assumed that each of you knew all about the past mistakes of the other. Otherwise, I never would have brought it up. Oh, it was bound to come up sometime anyway. Might as well smash things up now as later. An illegitimate child. That's pretty hard to take, Doc. I wouldn't worry too much about Sally's past misfortunes, Bob. Maybe when you hear the full story, you'll feel differently. I think I've heard all I want to hear. Okay, forget it. Why don't you tell me how you happened to get mixed up with V.D.? Oh, what's the use? You wouldn't believe me anyway. How did it happen? <laughs> I was taken advantage of by an unscrupulous woman. What? See, I knew you wouldn't believe me. Well, it happened back in college, the night before a friend of mine named Nicholas Weil shoved off for army duty. Well, Nick brought this woman up to the apartment house with him. Right into my room, in fact. I was asleep in bed, so help me, Doc. You mean that your own college friend got you mixed up with V.D.? I wouldn't call that very friendly. No, Doc, I guess you wouldn't. But I couldn't very well get mad at old Nick Weil. Nick got killed in our foxhole in the Battle of the Bulge, trying to toss a live grenade out of the hole. He died, so I and a couple of other fellows could go on living. So you see, I couldn't very well be sore at the fellow who saved my life. No, I guess you couldn't. Does Sally know anything about this? No, I never talk about it. Still gives me the creeps. I can see why. But go on. Let's hear the details. Okay. So now you know how our innocent little hero fell victim to an evil woman. Bob, you and a million other young fellas like you. Didn't your family ever tell you anything about the venereal diseases? No, we didn't talk about such things around our house. How about the schools? Nope. Same old story, eh? Still trying to keep the kids innocent through ignorance. By the way, do you know anything about VD now? Enough to recognize it? Oh, I don't know, Doc. I'm certainly no expert. Well, here's where you're going to get a liberal education on the subject. You're going to have kids of your own someday, and by heaven you're going to know what to tell them, so that they won't get into trouble like you did. I'm going to show you some pictures that we put together on VD. Shows you what it is, how to spot it, and what to do about it. So if you just flick off that light and pull up that chair, and I'll start this projector. This is VD, the venereal diseases. The most common contagious diseases in America today. This is what infects one person out of every ten. Men and women just like you. Not the person on your right, nor the one on your left, but you. There's one chance in ten that you yourself will be infected with VD. This is what attacks young and old, rich and poor, innocent and promiscuous. This is what causes childless marriages, paralysis, blindness, insanity, death. Three million people are walking or hobbling along our streets today with syphilis. Ten million more have gonorrhea. Thirteen million people. One-tenth of our whole population. There is more VD than typhoid plus diphtheria plus infantile paralysis plus tuberculosis plus scarlet fever, plus influenza. VD outshadows them all combined. And yet, 
VD can now be prevented. It can be controlled. It can be cured. All you need to know are these few simple facts. These are the two worst criminals, the germs of syphilis and gonorrhea. They are two different diseases. Syphilis is the most dangerous, but gonorrhea is the most prevalent. You can be infected with one or the other or both and you can be reinfected time after time. This is syphilis, a general disease which is carried in your bloodstream and which attacks your whole body. And this is how you catch syphilis, through intimate contact with an infected person, either through kissing or through sexual contact. It is almost impossible to catch syphilis in any other way simply because the syphilis germ cannot live outside the human body. The germ of syphilis is a spirochete, a little spiral bug that enters your body through a tiny break in your skin, wherever the contact occurred. And here are the warning signs, telling you that syphilis is at work in your body. Warning number one, this chancre or open sore. It appears two or three weeks after your exposure at the point where the contact occurred. It is painless. It stays for about six weeks, whether you try self-treatment or not. And then it disappears, whether you treat it or not. If you report to a doctor or health clinic during this first stage, syphilis can now be cured quickly and easily. If you neglect this first warning sign, syphilis will reappear as Warning number two, the skin rash. It appears from three to six months after the chancre has disappeared and been forgotten. It may resemble measles or scarlet fever, and it may appear on almost any part of the body. Like the chancre, this skin rash doesn't hurt, and it doesn't itch. And also like the chancre, no matter what kind of self-treatment you try, it stays for about six weeks. And then it too disappears, whether you treat it or not. If you report for proper treatment during this second stage, syphilis can still be cured quickly and positively. If you neglect it, syphilis then goes underground. The skin rash disappears, and the body looks like this, perfectly healthy and normal. This is the latent or hidden stage of syphilis. It lasts anywhere from five to 10 to even 20 years. Meanwhile, the spirochete of syphilis is burrowing deeper and deeper into your body, attacking your brain and nervous system or your heart and arterial system or both. Then five or 10 or 20 years later, in walks the third stage of syphilis. If the spirochete attacks your nervous system, you may develop blindness. 10% of all blindness is caused by syphilis. Or you might even develop paresis, that general paralysis of the insane. 10% of all insanity is caused by syphilis. or locomotor ataxia, that gradual paralysis of the feet and legs. Most locomotor ataxia is caused by syphilis. If the spirochete attacks your heart, you may develop a swollen heart, leaky valves, or hardening of the arteries, any one of which may kill you with a sudden heart attack. Thousands who die from heart trouble are really killed by syphilis. Even the innocent unborn child is not safe from the spirochete of syphilis. If the mother has syphilis and is untreated, eight out of 10 of these innocent children are born dead or crippled with syphilis. Yet almost all of them could be born alive and healthy if only the mother were given treatment before her fifth month of pregnancy. That's why every expectant mother should have a blood test. 
she owes it to her unborn child. The blood test is the only sure way to discover syphilis. If everyone would get a blood test once a year, and if all those infected would take treatment, modern medical science could wipe out syphilis in a matter of a few years. See any reliable doctor for a blood test. Or if you can't afford a doctor, see your local health clinic. And now, thanks to miracle drugs like penicillin, the cure for early syphilis can be quick and easy. In some rapid treatment centers, it takes only nine days. Now let's consider that other public enemy, gonorrhea. An arch criminal with half a dozen vulgar aliases, such as the clap, the dulse, the gleat, the strain, or the running range. Call it what you will, it's still gonorrhea. And it still infects more than 10 million people in America today, men and women alike, and in equal numbers. Gonorrhea is a local infection of the mucous membrane. It attacks the delicate lining of your sex organs. Almost without exception, gonorrhea is transmitted through sexual contact. The gonococcus germ cannot live outside the human body. It must be passed directly from one person to another. Here are the symptoms of gonorrhea in the male body. About three to five days after exposure, there is a discharge of white pus, like this, followed by a burning pain upon emptying the bladder. In the female, gonorrhea is much more difficult to detect. Here, too, there is a discharge of white pus from the urethra, like this, followed by a burning sensation upon emptying the bladder. But these symptoms often go unnoticed. That's why so many women have gonorrhea and don't even know it. Here is how the disease progresses into the male sex organs. Up the urethra to the bladder, or more likely into the prostate gland, and down the seminal ducts to the testicles. If unchecked, gonorrhea can cause prostate trouble or even sterility. It may work into your joints to cause crippling gonorrheal arthritis. Or if the germ is carried up to your eyes, it can cause impaired vision or even blindness. Gonorrhea does even more damage in a woman. It can work up the urethra to the bladder or more likely up the vagina to the cervix, then up through the uterus into the oviduct. Gonorrhea is the greatest single cause of sterility in women. And in addition, it can work into the joints to cause arthritis. Or if the germ is carried up to the eyes, it can cause impaired vision or blindness. The only sure way to detect gonorrhea is through a physical examination, including a microscopic search for the gonococcus germ. See any reliable doctor for such an examination. Or if you can't afford a doctor, go to your local health clinic. And like syphilis, gonorrhea can now definitely be cured by modern medical science, if treatment is given early. So if you've been exposed, see your doctor or health clinic at once. The complete cure can now be accomplished in days. These are the simple facts about the venereal diseases, syphilis and gonorrhea. Two different diseases that together affect about one out of every ten persons in America today. Remember syphilis, a general disease carried in your bloodstream. Remember the two warning signs of syphilis. First, this chancre or open sore followed several months later by this skin rash. Remember gonorrhea, a local infection of the mucous membrane. And remember these symptoms of gonorrhea, a discharge of white pus, followed by pain upon emptying the bladder in both men and women. Warning, 
never attempt self-treatment. You'll only drive the disease germs deeper into your body. And never seek treatment from a quack doctor. You'll only be wasting your money and ruining your health. See a reliable doctor or see your local health clinic. Remember, both syphilis and gonorrhea are now preventable, controllable, curable. Remember these facts and help rid America of these two terrible diseases that every year sterilize, cripple, paralyze, blind, and kill their millions of unfortunate victims. Excuse me, Bob. Someone in the front office. Hello, Sally. Glad you decided to come back in. Doctor, I, I had to talk to you. Are you alone? What's troubling you the most, Sally? It's about Bob and that awful disease. Are you sure he ever had anything so horrible? If you'll permit an old doctor to say so, I'm afraid you're making too much of Bob's misfortune and too little of your own. What do you mean? Just this. You're condemning Bob for something that happened way back when he was an ignorant kid at school. Meanwhile, you're overlooking your own mistakes. Maybe when you hear Bob's story, you'll feel differently. I don't want to hear about it. He had it. That's enough for me. Okay, let's forget about Bob's troubles and talk about yours. How did a nice young girl like you ever get into so much trouble? I don't want to talk about it, Doctor. I can understand your feelings. But remember, I'm just trying to help. Maybe if you told me all the facts, I might be able to patch it up. Who was the man, Sally? He's dead. Dead? How did he die? He was killed in action. He was with the infantry in Europe. I was never able to find out how or where. Who was he, Sally? His name was Nicholas Wilde. Why, Doctor, did you know him? No, Sally, no, I didn't know him. The name sounded sort of familiar, that's all. And did this Nicholas Wilde person know that he was going to be a father? No, I never told him. So you went through the whole thing alone. How did it all happen? Well, it all started when I was in college. Nicholas and I were engaged. See, Doctor? Yes, Sally. Yes, I see. And as a wise man once said, to know all is to forgive all. Sally, there's someone in the back office that's going to hear just what you told me. Doctor, is Bob in there? Yes. Let's go in and talk to him. No, Doctor. No, I don't even want to see him. Come, Sally. Doctor's orders. What are you doing back here? Checking up on me? You might answer that same question. I suppose you've been checking into my past since I've been gone. What makes you think I'm interested in your past? Or your future either, for that matter? Any girl who would run off and have an affair with some no-good guy and then expect a nice, decent fellow to... Nice, decent fellow? Nice, decent fellow? And I suppose that includes your old V.D., too. Just one more remark about V.D., and I'll forget I'm a nice, Keep decent fellow. Keep quiet, both of you. But I'm just... Keep still, Bob. Now, Sally, I want you to tell Bob just what you told me. But don't let him know who it was until I tell you to. I won't do it, Doctor. He doesn't deserve to know. What makes you think I'm even interested? Quiet. Go on, Sally. Tell your story. Remember, I'm only trying to help. All right, Doctor. There was a man named... Hold it, Sally. Don't let him know who it was until later. Well, I don't see what difference it makes. Bob didn't know him. It all happened back in college when I was engaged to 
Well, I'll, I'll call him Mr. X. It was all very wonderful at the time. I was in school then, and so was Mr. X. And we were young and engaged and so in love. It was all very heavenly, until that terrible day that Mr. X got his draft notice, and we knew we'd be separated, perhaps for years. So I, I guess we just tried to cram the rest of our lives into our one last day together. Mr. X had been gone for more than a month when I began to realize that we were in trouble. Even after I was sure, I still wouldn't believe it. I didn't want to believe it. I couldn't believe it. I guess every girl in trouble thinks there's some magic medicine she can swallow. But I don't have to tell you. None of it worked. It just made me sick. So, I tried the illegal doctors. I got this address. I went to his office. Late. One night. terribly afraid, but I was more afraid of not going to one of them. I think the hardest part of all came on the night I received word that Mr. X had been killed in action. You see, I hadn't told him. When I knew he'd never come back, I just lost all desire to carry on. I wasn't even thinking when I walked out and took a car down toward the docks. I guess the worry and the heartbreak, and finally the jump into the bay was a little too much for him. It was almost too much for me. And that's about all there is to tell. Who was Mr. X, Sally? Oh, what difference does it make? He's dead. So far, that's the only point in his favor. Who was the rat? That's no attitude to take. He didn't even know about it. That's still no excuse. Any man who would go off and leave an innocent girl like you to... Why, killing's too good for him. Who was he, Sally? Don't you think I deserve to know? Can I tell him now, Doctor? Yes, Sally, go ahead. 
I agree with Bob. I think he really deserves to know. His name was Nicholas Wilde. Why, Bob, did you know him? Yes, Sally. Yes, I knew him all right. Where? You never told me. You never asked me. It's a long story, Sally. A long, long story. You see, you never knew how he was killed. Oh, I know. I was never able to find out. Well, that's part of the story. How about it, Doc? Think she deserves to know? Yes. I think you both deserve to know all the facts. Go ahead, tell her the full story. Okay, Sally, darling. You ask for it. It all dates back to my happy, carefree college days. Nicholas Wilde and I went to school together. And it was on the night before Nick shoved off for army duty that all the trouble started. It's like I said, Doc. I was asleep, so help me. Nick had been out celebrating his last night as a civilian. I guess he thought he owed me a going away present. Anyway, he brought this woman back to the apartment just to keep me company. I didn't even know how it happened. Next morning, Nick dropped by to apologize. Then he left for the army. It wasn't until about a week later that I knew I was in trouble. Plenty of trouble. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. I was afraid to go to the college doctor. Afraid he'd have me thrown out of school. So, like most guys who don't know any better, I tried to doctor myself without very much luck. I'd heard from one of the other fellows in the house about a kind of a doctor who specialized in such diseases, so I went to see him. That was another mistake. About all that quack doctor did for me was cure me of my bank account. And I got no better fast. Then, to top things off, I got my draft notice. And I knew then the jig was up. Those army doctors would spot what was wrong with me in no time. And I didn't know what they'd do with me. So I reported for the draft. <laughs> and I had to. But I was wrong about the army. Instead of tossing me into the guardhouse, they sent me over to the hospital. And would you believe it? They actually cured the stuff in a few days. By pure coincidence, I joined up with Nick Wilde's outfit back east. Even shipped overseas with him. That's how Nick happened to be in the same foxhole with me when the live grenade rolled in. And he decided he'd rather die alone than have all of us die with him. Nick's body shielded us from the blast. I'm here to tell about it. And if it hadn't been for Nicholas Wilde, you wouldn't be here today. Is that right, Bob? That's right. I think I see now what the doctor meant. To know all is to forgive all. Well, children, how do you feel about each other now? Do I again hear wedding bells faintly in the distance? Doctor, could I be the first to say I'm sorry? After me, Sally. First, after me. All right, kids, all right. What you're both trying to admit is simply this. You both jumped to the conclusion that the other one's sins were black as midnight, while your own were white as snow. And then when you heard the full story, you realized how wrong you had been. But the truth of the matter is, you both have been guilty of some very serious offenses. And ignorance is no excuse. I guess that's about right, Doc. I wonder just how much heartbreak is caused by ignorance. Look at you two kids. 
Through ignorance, Sally was dragged through the worst ordeal a young girl can suffer, unwed motherhood. And by ignorance, Bob was dragged through something almost as bad, VD. And so, because each was ignorant of the suffering of the other, you each felt that the other had cheated you in some way. And so, by your own ignorance, you almost wrecked your plans for a happy marriage. Two nice kids who almost wrecked their lives and their chance for a happy marriage on ignorance. Do you think there's any hope for us, Doctor? Of course there's hope. You two are going to get married if I have to use the last ounce of my breath to talk you into it. Save your breath, Doc. I think Sally and I are beginning to understand one another. Good. It's about time. And now that holy matrimony is definitely back in the picture again, what do you two kids know about marriage? Anything? What should we know, Doctor? What should you know? Great heavens, what shouldn't you know? Do you know anything about the facts of life? Not very much, I'm afraid. How about you, Bob? Oh, I know a little bit, but I could stand to know a lot more. Didn't either of you ever learn anything about sex at home or in the schools? My mother always said that nice girls didn't talk about such things. No wonder kids get into trouble. No wonder we have so many juvenile delinquents. A million abortions a year. A quarter of a million illegitimate children. And almost half our marriages ending in divorce. It's ignorance that caused it. Deep, dark, abysmal ignorance on the most vital question in our lives. Look, you two, you're going to get married. For better or for worse, to have and to hold until death do you part. So you better learn something about sex right now. I have some pictures here that were made just for folks like you. You're going to sit quietly and look at them and never again Will you ever think of sex as anything but something wonderful, miraculous, almost divine? This is the wonderful story of life. The marvelous story of male and female. The magic story of sex. This is the story that tells us why our bodies were built as they are. How a woman becomes a mother. How a new life begins and how a tiny human egg grows into a living human child. This is the story of a miracle. The miracle of human reproduction. First, let us construct the bodies of the typical male and female. Let's see where they differ and why. Consider the male body, the high forehead, the wide jaw, the broad shoulders, the flat chest, the short trunk, the narrow pelvis, the narrow hips, and the long straight legs. Here is the body of the man the strong, lean body of the worker, the protector. Now let's examine the marvelous machinery that produces the male sex germs, the sperm cells that fertilize the female egg and thus create a new human life. Here are the testicles those prolific organs capable of producing millions of sperm cells every day. Leading upward from each testicle is this seminal duct, which carries the sperm cells up and stores them in this seminal vesicle. Here is the prostate gland, a donut-shaped organ which encircles the urethra and which produces the prostate fluid in which the living sperm cells swim. And here is the penis, 
honeycombed with tiny blood cavities and capable of being extended far beyond its normal relaxed size. Here at the tip of the penis is the glands, the sexual nerve center of the male. Now, for comparison, let us construct the body of the typical female. Note the lower forehead, the narrower jaw, the narrow shoulders, the full breasts, the long trunk and wide pelvis to accommodate the prenatal child, the wide hips, and the short legs. Here is the body of the mother, the incubator for the human egg. And again, for comparison with the male, let us examine the wonderful apparatus that produces the female egg and also provides a safe, warm nest in which the fertilized egg can develop into a living, breathing infant. Here on either side is an ovary, two remarkable organs which produce one mature human egg every month. Leading upward from each ovary to the uterus is this oviduct, which captures the mature egg and conducts it into the uterus. And here is the uterus, the nest or incubator for the human egg. The uterus opens downward through this neck or cervix into the vagina. And here is the vagina, the long tube-like passage that receives the male sex cells and conducts them back to the uterus. Here, just outside and above the vaginal opening, is the clitoris, the tiny sexual nerve center of the female. Now, let us watch the monthly female cycle, that wonderful series of functions which every 28 days prepares a woman to be a mother. Once every 28 days, one of these tiny graphene follicles on the ovary ruptures and releases a single mature egg. At the same time, a hormone is secreted into the bloodstream as a signal to the uterus to prepare a nest for the approaching egg. The egg passes up through the tips of the oviduct and moves slowly along toward the uterus. It is during this slow several day period of travel that the egg is ripe to be fertilized by the male sperm. Meanwhile, the uterus builds up a thick, rich lining filled with blood to provide a nest for the approaching egg. If the egg arrives at the uterus without having been fertilized, it has used up all its vital energy, so it dies. The ovary stops sending out the hormone signal, the uterus stops building up the nest of blood, and the entire unused lining of the uterus is carried away in the menstrual flow. This is the normal, healthy, monthly cycle of every mature woman capable of bearing children. The ovarian cycle that causes a woman's whole life to ebb and flow like the tides in a rhythmic 28-day pattern, a cycle that affects her mental outlook, her mammary glands, her body temperature, and the lining of her womb, a cycle controlled throughout by the ebb and flow of the magic female hormones that every 28 days prepare the way for the reproduction of the human race. Now, let us watch the still more interesting process of conception and prenatal development of the human child. Here is the female egg, magnified millions of times. Actually, this tiny egg is smaller than a grain of sand, and yet it carries within it all of the inherited characteristics of all the millions of ancestors of the woman who produced it. And here is the male sperm, 
also magnified millions of times. Like the egg, this tiny sperm carries within it all of the inherited characteristics of its millions of ancestors. Whether the child is a boy or a girl depends upon the sperm cell of the father. Here, once again, we see the unfertilized egg slowly moving along the oviduct. And from this closer view, we can now see the miracle of conception, the actual fertilization of the human egg. Here come the sperm cells, swimming up from the vagina, through the uterus, into the oviduct, like little fish racing upstream to spawn. Only one will enter and fertilize this egg. This is conception, the opening event in a new human life. We see the fertilized egg moving on down to its little nest in the uterus. And such are the miracles of life that if we could lift this fertilized egg out of the mother's body, and if we could nourish it in some sort of an incubator, it would actually grow into a normal human child. Once this tiny egg is fertilized, it is a complete human entity. It immediately starts to divide and redivide, all in accordance with some mysterious predestined plan busy with the great task of growing into a human being. All that the mother provides is an incubator in which the egg can develop through the nine long months of pregnancy. Now we will watch the whole cycle of development from the fertilized egg to the living child. Here is the egg four weeks after fertilization. Already all of the organs are indicated. At eight weeks, it has more than doubled in size. The brain develops more rapidly, so the head is the largest part. At 12 weeks, it has again doubled in size and weight. Tiny fingers and toes are now present. At 16 weeks, it has again doubled in size, and now the fetal heartbeat can be detected. At 20 weeks, there is another doubling in size and weight. Hair is present on the head. At 24 weeks, the body proportions begin to be much improved. At 28 weeks, the eyes and other features are all well developed. Only the lungs and digestive tract remain to be completed. At 32 weeks, the body proportions are so much improved and the organs so nearly complete that this child could survive if born at this time. At 36 weeks, the body is still better developed. All vital organs are now complete. At the end of 40 weeks or more than nine months after conception, the baby is at full term, ripe and ready for delivery into the outer world. And this is the newborn infant, fully equipped for life outside the mother's body. This is the miraculous outgrowth of the two tiny sex cells that have multiplied a million, million times. This is the story of life, the miracle of human reproduction. Turn the lights on, Bob.
Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. I guess you know how much we appreciate what you've done for us. It really was wonderful. I'd never thought about sex like that before. It had always seemed smutty or indecent. Yes, Sally, I know. The usual attitude of the unenlightened. But don't you kids imagine, because you know where babies come from, that you know all about marriage. Marriage is a very serious business. And the better you know each other, the happier you're going to be. So why don't you get yourself a good book on marital relations? Read it together on your honeymoon. Get to know one another. Okay, Doc. You're the doctor. Come on, Sally. Oh, Doctor, Dad's still stuck down in South America on that engineering job and won't be back for the wedding. I wonder if you'd substitute and give the bride away. I'd love to. And no one I'd rather give it to than this handsome gentleman on your left. <laughs> on, get out of here. At this point, we interrupt our picture to present in person Mr. Alexander Lee, noted commentator on moral and physical hygiene. His frank presentation of facts and figures will be informative, instructive, and interesting. And now, Mr. Alexander Lee. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Alexander Leeds, and I'm here tonight to discuss with you people a very important and vital subject, a subject that heretofore has been veiled in ignorance. But tonight, we are going to peel aside those veils. I want to start tonight by discussing something called juvenile delinquency. You've all read in the papers today, seen on radio and television, the terrible thing of juvenile delinquency. You know, there are so many young people today that are running around promiscuously that have no idea of the what is to be done in so far as their human sexuality. Now, if you as parents have waited until your boy or girl is 15 or 16 years of age before saying to him, son or daughter, I want to sit down with you and have a nice long talk about the birds and the bees and about sex. Your son or daughter will probably say something like this, okay mom or okay pop, what do you want to know? Now, we have tonight prepared a pair of books. One is called Father and Son, the other is called Mother and Daughter. Now, I don't have time to fully describe all of the material in this book. Believe me, there are dozens of chapters, there are pictures, there are graphs, but I would like to mention a couple of the chapters. First of all, there is a very vital chapter simply titled Masturbation. Now this chapter should be read not only by every teenager, both boy and girl, but by the parents of teenagers, so that this subject can be discussed completely. It also should be read by you guys up there in the balcony that are making all that noise. Now I'm going to go down a little further to a chapter called The Erotic Zones, The Eight Erotic Zones on a Woman's Body to be found by her partner, by her husband, to be fondled, handled, and caressed, to help bring that woman to more full, more complete passion in the love act. Now, in the woman's book, Mother and Daughter, there is a chapter simply entitled, The Control of Conception. Now understand me, ladies and gentlemen, I am not speaking about birth control. We do not advocate birth control either in this movie, in this book, or in this lecture. However, nature does operate in patterns, and every young girl, upon reaching puberty or womanhood, starts on her own personal menstrual month. This month is usually 28 days. Now, it may vary in some women from old 25 to 31, but on the average it is 28 days, and once, once in each menstrual month occurs what is known as the ovulation or fertile period. That is when the ovaries release the single female egg. This egg travels down the oviduct through the fallopian tubes and settles in the uterus or womb. Now if marital relations take place during this period and the male sperm unites with the female ovum then the miracle of conception takes place. I cannot emphasize too strongly the value of these two books. You know, in my opinion, a set of these books belongs on the living room 
desk or the bedside table of every home in America. Now think of it. For less than the cost of a carton of cigarettes, every home can own a set of these books. And as I said before, I think they belong in every home. If one of these books, just one of these books, can save a young girl from the shame of unwed motherhood, or a young boy from the ravages of venereal disease, there is no telling how much they are worth. But as I said before, we sell them tonight for one dollar, one dollar only. Now my agents will pass up and down the aisles among you at this time. If you care to take home one or both of the books, read them in the privacy of your home. Discuss them with other family members, particularly with your children. Please hold up your hands at this point and have the exact change ready if possible. I am sorry, but we must limit the purchase of two sets to a customer in order that everyone will have a chance to receive these publications. I want to thank you tonight for your very kind attention. I want to wish for you all a very long life, a very happy life, but above all, a very healthy life. Thank you, good night, and God bless you. how it all happened. Remember? I remember all right. Every bit of it. Say, I'm overstaying my time. I've got several more calls to make tonight. Sally, I'll pick up that specimen in the morning and run an AZ test. And if you and Bob will drop in in about a week, I'll let you know if you're going to be parents. And while you're there, I'm going to show you some pictures on human birth. As long as you're both going to be parents, you ought to know how it happens. Okay, Doc, we'll sure be there. All right, Doctor. And Doc, Make it a positive test, will you? I've got some big plans for that little fellow. I'll do my best. Well, here we are, Doc. All pins and needles for the big news. The kids, I'm glad to report that you can expect parenthood. Happy, honey? Mmm, very, very happy. <laughs> Doctor, how can you tell for sure when a woman's going to have a baby? Well, that's simple. You remember that morning specimen I picked up last week? Well, that was the clue. You see, when a woman is pregnant, there are a lot more hormones in the blood, and some are eliminated through the kidneys. How can you tell from that? You inject a sample into a female virgin rabbit, and then watch to see if the ovaries develop. If they do, it shows that the hormone is there, and the woman is pregnant. That's the easy test. Was well, it a sure test, Doc? Sure is one we know. And in your case, you'd be safe in buying a baby buggy. <laughs> now, if you kids will take your seats, I'm going to show you some pictures on how babies are born, Bob. I know. The light. <laughs> this is the story of human birth. The story that tells us how we first came into the world. Here is a baby in its mother's womb, all ready to be born. There are two ways in which this infant can be delivered. The first is called a normal birth. Here the child passes downward through the natural birth canal. The second is called a cesarean section. Here the child is taken from the mother's womb through an incision in the abdominal wall. In order to see clearly just how babies are born, let us follow this typical expectant mother through a modern maternity hospital. After registering in, the young mother-to-be is given every care and attention as she awaits the arrival of her baby. When the normal labor contractions are well underway and the time for birth is close at hand, the mother is carried into the delivery room. Meanwhile, her doctor scrubs his hands to sterile cleanliness in preparation for the delivery.
This mother will deliver her baby in the normal way, down the natural birth canal. Here we see the mother positioned upon the delivery table, ready for the birth of her child. For several hours, these rhythmic labor contractions have been underway, gently forcing the baby downward from the womb along the birth passage. To aid the normal process of birth, the doctor inserts an instrument which opens the sac containing the baby and thus releases the surrounding fluid. And now, before our very eyes, we see a miracle take place. The actual normal birth of a human child. Most babies enter the world head first, and once the head is through the outer opening, the rest of the body follows quickly. And here he is, a brand new seven pound baby boy. First, the doctor cleans out the baby's nostrils, which are usually plugged with mucus. This helps start the little fellow breathing for the first time in his life. Next, he clamps and cuts the umbilical cord through which the infant was nourished inside the mother's body. Finally, a few drops of silver nitrate solution are placed in the baby's eyes, a precaution against blindness from chance gonorrheal infection. This is required by law. And here is the little newcomer breathing the outside air for the first time, a normal, healthy, seven-pound bundle of activity. Now let us watch the other method of delivery, an actual caesarean section whereby the child is taken from the mother's womb through an incision in the abdominal wall. Thanks to the miracles of modern surgery, an expectant mother need have no fear of a cesarean delivery. Today, thousands of mothers who are unable to bear their children in the normal manner now deliver them safely and painlessly through surgery. Here we see the latest in cesarean technique, a short horizontal incision which minimizes scar tissue. The opening through the abdominal wall is made just large enough to pass the baby's head. Layer after layer of protective fat and muscle tissue must be penetrated in order to reach the baby deep inside the mother's womb. Working with beautiful skill and coordination, the surgeons carefully approach the pear-shaped womb or nest which encloses the infant. With the greatest of care, the chief surgeon makes the incision into the womb itself. Here too, the opening is made just large enough to pass the baby's head.
Next, the surgeon carefully opens the sac inside the womb, which contains the baby. This releases the fluid which surrounds the baby. Now, then in goes the surgeon's hand after the baby. Normally, the child is in a head downward position, so it must be turned end for end in order to be taken out head first. These instruments are slipped around the infant's head to aid in the delivery. Once the baby is out of the mother's womb, he is treated just like any other newly born infant. He is slapped roundly to start his breathing. If necessary, the little newcomer is given a few whiffs of oxygen to help start his lungs to working. Now the surgeons begin the long, delicate task of closing up the incision, a task which calls for perfect teamwork and coordination. First, the wall of the womb itself must be closed. Then, layer after layer of muscle and fat must be joined back together. It is surgical skill such as this that has taken the guesswork out of motherhood. And more important, it has made it possible for women to have as many as four or even five children by caesarean section. This entire operation is virtually painless for the mother. She was given a spinal injection, which rendered the entire lower portion of her body insensitive to pain. And she has remained semi-conscious throughout the whole procedure.
when the surgeons reach the outer layer of skin they close off the incision with these handy metal clips which are easily removed after the opening has knit together These ingenious little fasteners hold the outer skin firmly and leave almost no visible scar. Now the incision has been entirely closed and the mother is ready to be taken back to her hospital bed where she will be given special attention until she is ready to go home with her baby. This is the story of birth, the story that tells us how we first saw the light of day. That's all. Now, Sally, I want you to keep in close touch with me. According to the law, I'll have to give you a VD blood test just to make sure. We'll work out your proper diet, and all in all, it'll be a lot of fun. Honestly, Doc, you've been wonderful. I just wish the rest of the world could have you around to help them through their troubles. It's been wonderful for me, too. You know, the most pleasure in being a doctor is helping kids like you. Goodbye, Dr. West. I'll be in to see you often. Goodbye, Sally. Bob. Goodbye, Doc. And by the way, are you going to teach the little fellow the facts of life as you go along? Amen, Doc. You'll be the most educated little rascal in the whole neighborhood. And what Bob doesn't teach him, or her, I will. There'll be no more ignorance in this family. Okay. And remember, Bob, the new ones have four corners. So you better start in practicing right away. <laughs> God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. <laughs>